Welcome to Jat Chat presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Kara Radzak from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and today we'll have a roundtable discussion from the first authors of multiple manuscripts related to concussion recently published in the February 2023 issue of the Journal of Athletic Training. First up, we have Dr. Landon Lampke. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the Michigan Concussion Center and Exercise and Sports Science Initiative at the University of Michigan. His research focuses on reaction time and human movement biomechanics to establish objective return to play decision-making criteria and ultimately optimize clinical practice related to concussion. Next, we have Dr. Rachel Lee, who serves as the clinical coordinator and assistant professor in the Master's of Athletic Training Program at Mercer University. Her research includes understanding repetitive head impact in underrepresentative sports. And we are joined today by Mr. Matthew Wingerson, a first-year doctoral student at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, working with our favorite Dr. David Powell, from the Colorado Concussion Lab. His research focuses on post-concussion research, neurophysiology, and improving clinical practices with an overarching aim of enhancing our understanding of concussion and improving patient outcomes. Thank you all so much for joining me, Landon, Rachel, and Matthew. Thank you for coming on to Jat Chat. At this point in time, Rachel, I would love for you to give us a little bit of an introduction into the publication that you and your author team put out. Yeah, for sure. So first of all, that author team was phenomenal. I mean, they are kind of, you know, the good old breadwinners, if you will. So I admire them and I was super fortunate to get called on to this um, publication and help them out. So really, we were looking at the psychometric properties of the Kingsley Vic test. There wasn't really a whole lot of research on it. So they really were interested in looking at the diagnostic accuracy using sensitivity and specificity, which I think is really important um, because it kind of helps with guiding um, clinical practice and athletic training. Um, So essentially for this research, we wanted to look at the sensitivity and specificity, but across multiple time points for athletes with a concussion. Um, And then we wanted to look at to see if there was any confounding factors that also contributed uh, to their time as well. So... um, Sex, gender, age, um, sport type, so on and so forth. Um, so that was really interesting to kind of see um, that it is pretty great at the zero to six and 24 to 48 hour time point. Um, so it had really good diagnostic accuracy and positively predicting a concussion. Um, but it kind of had this downfall a little bit at the asymptomatic uh, time point, which is kind of what we had imagined that would happen uh, just because you know, there's a lot of practice effects that are with King Bibic because uh, it's a repetitive number naming tool. Um, so they kind of get an idea and used to what is about to happen. Um, and then it kind of got better improvement during return to play and then at six months as well too. So huge practice effects with that as well. But you know, it kind of helps with the clinical side of things. If they want to do something very quickly on the sideline, it helps really target ocular motor function. So for those people that might not be familiar with actually implementing the King David test, What are you asking your uh, patient to do? Yeah, great question. So now it's on a tablet base, so um, electronic base now. It used to be on um, note cards. Uh, So essentially it is a less than two minute test. Um, The participants will essentially name numbers that are visible on the screens, start left to right, working their way from top to bottom. Um, And it's based on time, so how quickly they complete the assessment. So the first card actually has um, guidelines to kind of help them go through left, right, going up um, top to bottom. And then the second card, the guidelines get removed. And then for the third card, uh, the guidelines are removed and there's not symmetrical um, numbers anymore. So it kind of gets a little bit difficult as it goes. But now with the iPad assessment, the athlete or participant is responsible for the time. So essentially they have to start and stop their own time using the tablet at the corner of the screen. So there has been research to suggest that it is better using an iPad versus the card system where the administrator would have to use a stopwatch and kind of see where that last number would be type of deal. And that was one of the things that you found to be different in your study, right? Is the difference between iPad and the cards. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so essentially we found that the iPad version actually had better sensitivity and detect 
action of um, a concussion. So I think with that, it might just be with the athletes now, you know, with everything going to a digital platform, that maybe they're used to seeing things that way um, better than it would be like on a paper pen copy. Um, and I think with the, the test administration, it also has a higher retest reliability too. So there has been previous research um, that has shown that the iPad version is kind of helps eliminate administrator bias, if you will. So that was kind of really cool to see that our data was also mirrored with somebody else's results too. And how would you recommend based upon your findings, clinicians utilize this exam? Yeah, great question. So, you know, like I said before, the zero to six and the 24 to 48, so kind of really in that immediate acute window of using the King Divic is kind of like the sweet spot. Um, and it's, you know, we're really not cost, um, highly in cost to administrate it. Um, but I think it really gets after the ocular motor standpoint of things. Now, it has to be proceeded with caution when you're going beyond that immediate um, acute phase, just because of what we found that it doesn't really have great sensitivity specificity at the asymptomatic return to play mark, so on and so forth. So it kind of backs up that, you know, with concussion evaluation, it shouldn't be a standalone tool, um, but it could be useful for somebody who needs to assess ocular motor function rather quickly. So in contrast, you, you found some things that were going to be great for that initial time point. And then um, Matthew, you guys were looking at more of the return to play. Same thing with you, Landon. So Matthew, can you give us an overview of um, the study that you were first author on? Yeah, absolutely. So we were investigating tandem gait as a clinical assessment for adolescents with concussion. Uh, and I don't want to assume that everyone knows what tandem gait is. Um, so I can go into as much detail as you want here, but I think the, the manuscript is pretty detailed in the methods. We actually also just finished a video that kind of walks people through the tandem gait test as well. Oh, that I'd be happy to send your direction um, and link into the description here. But essentially tandem gait is a measure of dynamic postural control. And so what patients are doing is performing this tandem gait test. It's a heel toe walking test. The primary outcome is time to completion. So they're walking in this heel toe pattern down a three meter line and back. And we're just timing how, how long it takes them to complete this task. So we can do that in single task conditions, which is what I just described. And we can also do that in a dual task condition where we add in this cognitive piece. So we add in some sort of cognitive task and now the attention begins to divide and we're measuring uh, the ability to, to control posture while you're also having to complete this cognitive piece. The title of your manuscript definitely is going to perk some people's ears up, right? <laughs> Clinical feasibility and utility, right? Yeah, Anytime yeah. you throw out those words. So what, what were you looking for? What do you mean by clinical feasibility and utility? Um, for utility, what we were mainly focused on is the ability of the tandem gait test to distinguish between patients with concussion and un uninjured controls. And specifically, what we wanted to know is do we need to do all three trials of tandem gait? People are typically doing multiple trials of this test, or can we get away with kind of an abbreviated test where we're just doing one or two trials, but getting the same information. So that's our measure of utility. We did this AUC analysis to provide um, a, a specific number that kind of tells us how well this test performs. Um, and then the feasibility piece is a little bit different. It's really understanding uh, the time requirements and the burden of the test. And so we're using that idea of the number of trials performed kind of as a proxy for that. We're trying to understand, you know, three trials worth of this test is a lot different than having a patient perform one trial, particularly when they're, you know, maybe within a week of injury, still symptomatic. They don't want to be here in the clinic at all. How can we kind of uh, maximize that feasibility while also maintaining a high level of utility for clinical practice? Um, and then the last piece, too, is just sort of outlining the methods. And so we were very detailed in the manuscript on our methods for tandem gait, which I think is a huge strength of this piece of work just because um, the test is not uniform from site to site. 
And so what we really wanted to do was put on paper something that explains this assessment in detail so that we can start to create some uniformity in, in this assessment. So what's the biggest bang for your buck? <laughs> what is going to give the best outcome, most information with the least amount of clinician time? <laughs> That's what everyone's interested in. So uh, what we found is two trials of single task tandem gait. So you do a practice trial, and then the second trial is the scored trial or the time to trial. Um, that provides the biggest uh, difference between concussed and control participants. And then the first trial under dual task conditions as well. And for that task, uh, cognitive test, we use just a backward spelling task, which is outlined in the paper as well. Um, but it's just those, those three uh, trials in total versus the six or eight that are often used in, in other research or in clinical practice. The other thing I'll say that we found is just thinking about the outcomes of the tandem gate assessment. And so one of the outcomes is time to completion, but you can also measure cognitive performance under that dual task paradigm. Uh, and what we found was that cognitive performance is not a particularly strong indicator of concussion versus control. Instead, we should be focusing on time to completion in this assessment. So it's really about melding together the cognitive and the motor demands and evaluating how the motor demands change. And one of the things that, um, that I found interesting about your paper is you evaluated three different cognitive components of the dual task, and they were not all created equally. Um, so give us some recommendations of if you're, yeah. if you're wanting to incorporate dual task and feel free to encourage us why we should, um, <laughs> incorporating dual task and then which cognitive component do you take? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So ultimately, when you're thinking about cognitive pieces in this assessment, what our research has found is that you just need a cognitive task to get into that dual task situation where your attention is divided. And so the performance on those tasks maybe is less relevant than the time to completion scores in single and dual task conditions. And so the, the cognitive task that we found was most useful is this words backward task. So it's just the simple spelling of a five letter word backwards. We also used a few other cognitive tasks. Serial subtraction was one of them. So we're asking people to start at a two digit number and then count down by six or seven. Um, we also used one of reciting the months in reverse order. None of those were, were particularly good at differentiating concussed from control patients. Um, so I would stick with words backwards for now, at least until more research comes out. Um, but more important than that, again, is really measuring time to completion. And you, you talk about, um, you know, the validation or, or why we should use tandem gait in the clinic. I think the, the other option is the balance error scoring system or uh, modified balance error scoring system. And ultimately, we feel the tandem gait is a little bit more of an, a sensitive assessment. And so when you're comparing AUC numbers, there's a really good paper out there by Jesse Oldham, which um, found AUC for MBES is like 0 0.53, and a 0 0.50 is a coin flip of probability, right? So we're just slightly better at diagnosing concussion than a coin flip is using MBES or BES, right? Versus what our paper has found with tandem gait, some of these AUC values are quite high, somewhere in the, the 0.8, uh, high 0.8s. And so ultimately, it's just a better assessment. It's more objective instead of subjectively scoring an error. I, I've been doing this research for a number of years. I still don't really know what an error is on the best, if I'm being entirely honest. And so now you have a little bit more of an objective assessment that's measuring time to completion versus the subjective thing um, that can be hard to quantify. And then, Landon, you guys took this uh, dual task thing a little bit further and tell us about this, um, the new tool that you guys are developing. Yeah, so what we kind of came up with is using dual task paradigms, but we're taking that and applying it to reaction time, where we know it has 
fairly strong and robust deficits after a concussion. And so the idea, idea behind this was, all right, can we marry these two together and elicit this dual task effect with a already sensitive measure? On top of that, make it so it's actually functional, uh, functional and related to sport. Um, that's kind of the initial theory is that the clinical measures we do today are not necessarily representative of return to play activities in sport specifically. So for example, clicking a mouse button or space bar for computerized neurocognitive testing is far different from going back onto sport where everything's in a chaotic state and you're having to make split decision making uh, decisions in regards to the players coming at you. And so this isn't getting directly at that, but nonetheless, we're recruiting the much more gross motor demands of the individual through this assessment. So with this, we're calling it the standardized assessment of reaction time. Um, and so with this, it is looking at a variety of components where we do standing single leg balance and then a athletic squatted position and cutting task as they react to a, a pin light, which most clinicians are gonna have in their, uh, their kits and using their smartphone that's video recorded, which your smartphone has the capability of recording at the same speeds as a motion capture lab now, which is uh, pretty pretty great to have in your pocket. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind those components. But we do those again with the dual task, which Matt's already kind of talked about um, a bit here, but with ours, it's using subtraction and simply because it's a little bit easier to score if you would like to, but also because it's a relatively simple, or it's a deceivingly simplistic task in that sense. And where are you guys in the continuum of getting this ready for clinical practice? Yeah, so the first steps um, were to determine reliability, validity, and what is a minimal detectable change? So what actually means a change has happened with this measure? So that was the first steps. And um, ironically enough, those are also gonna be published in the Journal of Athletic Training here in the future. Um, so those are online open access. But that was phase one. And so if those things were not met, we weren't gonna continue forward. There's no point in burdening patients or especially clinicians with the assessment that doesn't add value or is unreliable. And so those things checked out, it was reliable, it was valid. So the next step was, okay, let's put this into pre-injury baselines where there's in theory less burden, but also let's see how it holds up to confounders for things such as age or sex or concussion history things we know that are problematic and make decision-making hard with concussion assessments. And so that was the first step with that and is the findings we're reporting here. Um, and so with that, the future next steps based off these findings here and a few other papers we have with these data is to essentially start implementing this into clinical practice and monitor individuals after their concussion and see how this actually improves care. Because really, at the end of the day, if this is not uh, helping or augmenting clinical practice for the clinician or the patient, I'll just go on record and say, it. we don't need to do it. I'm not gonna push this assessment on anyone. It should improve something. If it doesn't, we don't necessarily need to do it, or maybe we substitute it for other things, but that's the goal is to kind of improve and optimize clinical care. And there's so much in, in relation to concussion, initial evaluation, return to play, that we're constantly evaluating and learning new things. And that means that the clinician is constantly getting inundated of what's changing, how should I change my clinical practice? So can you guys kind of each speak on how do your findings, what should be the take home message that a clinician has? How does it potentially fit into augmenting or changing their clinical practice? Rachel? Yeah, great question. You know, I think, um, especially with the King Divit, because it can be utilized so quickly, I think that it has really good potential. But kind of like what I stated before, it's it's great immediate and acutely, but I think clinicians should, you know, be cautious about moving forward when it comes to return to play decision making. And I think that's when other assessment tools, kind of like what these other two are talking about, um, maybe more beneficial for clinicians and actually seeing that, um, especially with the recovery and the safety for that athlete too, and not solely relying on just one test. So it's giving you a little bit in that immediate, immediate phase, something to yeah, exactly. grab onto. And Matthew, how about you? Yeah, I think I think the tandem gate is a really useful assessment for concussion evaluation. Um, I think that it has specific advantages over BES or MBES, which 
I know is used quite often right now. Um, and we kind of already outlined those things. And so as far as fitting into clinical practice, it would be great from our perspective to use this in place of invest. It's a little bit more sensitive. Um, I believe INVEST, uh, you know, sort of normalizes within, I think it was 72 hours worth of injury or, or maybe a few days. Um, and so now anybody who's being evaluated outside of that time frame, which is a huge number of people with concussion, uh, the best may not pick up deficits which do exist. And so using something else, a more sensitive tool like tandem gate, I think could be really useful. And we're trying to increase the, fe the feasibility of that assessment. And yeah, and so I'll just, um, with our study that we're talking about today, we didn't necessarily assess how this relates specifically to concussion. This was kind of the phase one before getting to what we'd maybe call phase two or three that Matt and Rachel are talking about, those same type of designs. But nonetheless, with this assessment, what I would say is um, we've determined it's a reliable and valid measure, and it's fairly robust to outcome or to confounders regarding its outcomes. And so with this, kind of the take home with this is even thinking beyond concussion, if examining functional reaction time is a goal of the clinician, um, this tool can do it. Uh, we don't even need to talk about concussion specifically, but I know with ACL research and ankle research, we're starting to see this connection between neurocognition and lower extremity injury. And so nonetheless, this can be a tool to assess these things just beyond um, typical injured in athletics. And that teases up to kind of talk all of us together of what are some things that you're expecting to see? There's probably going to be new updates to a lot of the position statements and to a lot of the concussion literature out there. What are some things that you're expecting to see changes for clinicians to be ready for potentially? I'm asking you to predict the future a little bit, but let's have let's have fun with what what are you things you think that you might we might see here soon. I think I'll start us off. I'm a, I'm excited to kind of see um, you know, what does exercise look like within the, the concussion recovery? And I'm hopeful that we'll have a more, you know, concrete step-by-step -step on what that looks like for certain patients. And I and I'm hopeful that clinicians will get on board with that too, instead of, you know, getting away from the rest is best or cocoon therapy type of deal. So I'm really excited um, to see that because I know those athletes with a concussion are eager to get back as soon as possible. And sometimes they'll go behind the athletic trainers back and do cardio and exercise um, because they're, they're just eager and they want to get back to sport. Yeah, I think we're all eagerly awaiting the release of the, the SCAT 6 and SCOTE 6 uh, at this point. And who knows what will be on that. But um, I know that we're hopeful in the paper is, is on tandem gate, right? And so we're hopeful that that's included in the SCAT 6. Um, in particular, I hope that they make notes on cognitive tasks and start to think about uniformity. Um, because right now, there, there's a lot of different ways to perform this assessment. Um, we've used one in our research, but I know that, you know, some people use four trials. Some people score this as the best, best time out of four trials. In the SCAT 5, I think it was just a yes, no uh, uh, option of whether or not you were able to perform um, the test. And so maybe just a little bit of uniformity there would be great. Yeah, and I think I so maybe not speaking to existence, but hopefully the horizon of things to come is kind of this theme of this uh, this conversation is stronger return to play decision making tools. Um, arguably, they've gone unchanged since two thousand, the early two thousands. It's been about twenty years where it's rest and then symptom monitoring and time since injury, and that is essentially the equation. And a lot of that. Um, that decision making is in the hands of the athlete. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we do know that symptoms are self reported. And so I think the end all goal is objective, reliable information to guide return to play um, or even return to learn or any of these criteria we're talking about. But moving beyond um, the uh, time frame, it reliant kind of components of those. Awesome. Thank you guys all again so much for joining me today on this Concussion Roundtable. Dr. Lee, Mr. Wingerson, and Dr. Lemke. 
Thank you again so much and provided a wide breath, but also a really great deep dive into your individual papers. And like mentioned, open access. So freely accessible for everyone to go out there and read up on your work. Thank you again for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. you.